Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Coding Warriors 2024 workshop. I consider this sort of a coding boot camp. I'm going to attempt to distill one year of programming knowledge to you in two hours. So, uh, without further ado, here we go. My name is Adam. I teach computer programming and game design in the Las Cruz district. Um, my hope is that uh, one day your young students here will take an interest in of those fields. I also teach AP computer science, and in a few years, I might see some of them that happen to be in the area there. Okay, so um, we are programming with online-python.com. Any Python compiler in general will work if you want to mess around with this at home, but this is the one that will be available at the actual events and practice events, so this is the one I recommend getting comfortable with. Um, the overall format here is you can write your code, and I'm kind of zoomed in so you can see everything on the screen here. And then um, down here, you can hit run and you can see what happens. I don't have any actual code here, and this is sort of the first and most important lesson of any programming language, and that's documentation. Um, comments is what they're called here. Uh, in Python, your comments are written with this little um, pound sign here, the hashtag symbol, as the young people might know. Anything you write after that in line is not code, it's just a note for yourself. So everything I've written here is an outline for myself, is just comments, it's not code to compiler which is the computer running the code, will not see it at all, okay? Um, so at the top, I'm giving myself a title here. So that's the most important lesson in, in programming is to write comments for yourself as an outline before you actually write the code. This helps you organize your thought process and it also serves as documentation for you after the fact. So if you need to look at your code later on, you can actually understand what you wrote. That's very helpful. Okay, so no matter what language you're, you're working in, I might teach C Sharp and Java primarily, or Python or any other language, there's going to be some kind of a comment system. And that's the most important thing in all coding. If you don't remember anything else today, please remember that if you're ever looking at coding again. Okay, so I will put all my notes in comments here. Um, this is to help get organized and so you can see what's really important. If you're a particularly fast typist, you may want to get those along with me. If not, just follow along up here and then you can type the actual code. I'll do my best to leave it on the screen as long as I can before moving on. Again, one year into two hours. I may go a little briskly. Okay, so um, comments, notes, the compiler doesn't see. And it's on. They start with this stuff. And now, let's see it's after the bed and go until the end of the night. Writing an outline before coding is called pseudocode. Is really, 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 really important. Okay, cool. So, with that, our actual code in Python. The most basic statement you're going to see in Python is a print statement. Um, we'll have quite a few of these on the actual test day itself. That's simply the word print here without that little comment thing about it because this is actual code. And then um, um, something inside the parentheses here after the print. Okay, um, so if I say print for I will get something like that. In Python, unlike some other languages, there's no need to put anything at the end of the line to show that it's the end of the statement. In C Sharp and Java, we have a semicolon there in Python, not necessary. The line break is what tells Python, oh, that's the end of the statement here. Okay, so if I have just that much as my code here, and I go down to this and I click the run button, it will show me my output here, which is four. Okay. Congratulations, you've just written your first line of code. You are now in accomplished and for good work. Don't talk to yourself, that's fine. Um, okay. um, so that's for a number that doesn't require any extra code to make it work. Um, a more common uh, thing to print is a message of some sort. Those messages are called strings. Okay. So, uh, a message in quotes. Is called a string. We can put those in a print statement as well. So if I say I write the quotes here, and then I say um, I am a programmer, go like that, and then I go back down here. Oops, I'm gonna go down here like so, and I run this. Sure enough, I get back output like so. Okay, so those print statements are going to be the, the simplest kind of statements you're going to see. We'll see quite a few of them in your actual coding. 
All right. Comments by the way here can go in line. They don't have to have their own line. So if I take this and I just move it down here to the end of this line, that still works. So I will do that. This is the value. You can combine two different strings together. Um, using the plus operator, that's a really fancy word called concatenation. It just means smashing two strings together. So if I say quit um, putting two strings, then together, whatever. So it's called Concatenation, concatenation, it's kind of like it is. Smashing strings together. No, I didn't get on it. Sure, they would. Put it string together, yeah. yeah. Still close. Okay, so if I run that, I have that there. One thing to notice here, thank you, is that it literally prints the two next to each other. If you want to space in between them, down here in your output, oh, sorry, I lost my. That was weird. Um, if you want the space here, let's see how this relates to the code up here. You have to actually put a space in the quotes because it prints a literal message. Why is it doing that? Hmm, strange. I can't seem to highlight my video, which is kind of annoying. You see how it's got the strings and together together there. If I want something different, then I need to put a space inside the quotes because the string is, is what we call literal. It's printing exactly what's in the quotes. So if I wanted to do better, I would put a space right there, let's say, and run it, and there we go. Okay, so that's your basic print statement. Um, you can also print a number smashed together with a string, but to do that, you have to put an str in front of the number for the string. So um, say, doing, um, let's see, you can print, or you can concatenate, I'll use that fancy word there. Concatenate a number with a string by using str and then the value inside the quotes. Say number. Something like, whoops. Print. Um, 45, I'm sorry, Mr. 45, there we go. Yes. I've used the code. I don't know what the 45 uses the code, I know a few. Yeah. What I get there is that one. Just a little respect. You can't just put up the 45 by itself because I'm treating it like a string. Okay. In more technical terms, that's called casting, but you don't need to worry about that for right now. Okay, yeah, so those your basic print statements, and that's like other strings as well. So what strings are those, those messages and quotes. So we're going to go down there. So let's talk variables. This gives us the basic values. You can, print, you can put a lot of different things inside a print statement. Um, you can put your integers like I have there, like the whole number four. You can put decimal values um, in programming language. Those are called doubles. So I'll actually put that on here too. Um, and Six point eight. Okay, let's start. Six point eight. There we go. Because I want to concatenate it with message. Where is a double value? And that just to make sure we're okay. Another important lesson about programming is that you want to run your code frequently. If you make a change, make sure that your output is what you expect. You don't want to write several lines of code and then run it and find out either you have a mistake in your output or it doesn't run at all. So run it frequently. You've got that right there by way of coding here in the compiler. So make use of it. All right. I'm able to get some of this output yourself on your computer. Um, I will say that I'm going to take a second to divert here. Um, I used to be a math teacher and the reason that we teach programming uh, at the high school level currently and hopefully at 
more love as, um, as every elementary school will introduce these concepts of programming pretty soon. Um, is that programming teaches a lot of the same concepts that math does. It, the reason we teach math is because we want students to understand logical thinking and communicating through symbols and that sort of thing. Um, the advantage that programming has over math, as I see it, having taught both, is threefold. Um, one, students tend to find programming a lot more interesting because it's a little bit more engaging to write something here and see the results. Two, everything you do in programming is what we call teaching a manipulative, meaning you are changing something and seeing what happens here. Um, so it's the interest level, but it's also being able to see what happens. In, in a good math class, we want to see a lot of manipulatives. And then, so uh, uh, the way I like to say it is in a math problem on your paper, you can make a correction here, you can make a change, and then you have a slightly different piece of paper. You can make a change to your code here and actually see what the computer says. And then um, the third reason there is that you can take these programming skills and pretty directly make money with it, which, you know, once you're an adult, which people tend to enjoy. Question. I have a question that you pointed in the demo. Mm -hmm. Both, because I noticed in some of the practice where you programming language, mm -hmm. does the class have a double? Maybe you're right. Maybe it's not a double, maybe it's a flip. Sorry. Um, this is like, I don't know how to teach C sharp. So if you treat it like a float, so that means that's a valid question. I can't pretend to know everything. <laughs> um, I have doubles. You're right. I think there's no such thing. Doubles use the bits and stuff. I apologize. It's a full value, not a double value. I was using C sharp language. Thank you for that. Corrected. Um, only insofar as they have the string here, the string cast. Otherwise, I don't believe casting is covered in the scope of the rules here. So, do you have any questions explicitly about casting other than string casting? Like so. Okay. Great. So that's, I mean, pretty much shows strings here. So those are your basic print statements. Pretty much what you need to know about those is covered there. Um, if you'd like to concatenate a number with a string, you can use this, this stir method right here. Um, otherwise, you can just print it straight up or print a string by itself. Good. 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 Okay, um, the, you know, the first sort of big principle of coding that makes it powerful is the use of variables. Um, variables here are pretty close to what you might remember from algebra class. The difference is in an algebra class, a variable has a specific set value, and you're looking to find that value most of the time or use that value, plug it in. Um, in coding, that value can change pretty frequently as you run through your code and get a new value. Okay, um, so. Think of a variable like a placeholder. That's what I use. Um, so variables are placeholders for a particular value that can be set using the assignment operator, which is equals. I just won't end that sentence with a period. That's okay. So, um, in JSON, it's what we call a weekly type language. C Sharp and Java are strongly type languages, meaning you have to specify what type a variable is. In Python, you don't have to do that. You can just use a name, say this X or whatever. A variable could be called just about anything that's not a keyword here, um, and say this is that thing's value. So, I can say something like X equals 11. And now, this is the variable. Let's just say, um, you know, read this. This variable I read with a value of in quotes. Okay. 
Okay. So I can then print. This equals, and then this is a number, so you want to go stir x like so. You can print I word equals, and then it's a string, so we don't need a stir this time. We can have it there, I believe, it doesn't matter. And so when that we get x equals 11, number equals power, which you would hopefully expect from seeing. You can reuse variables so I can update the value of x once I've got it there. Um, I can even update it to a different type. It's just going to use whatever type it is at the given moment. So the types that we're working with on this test data types, data types. variables will hold on. Uh, and so it's not that it. <laughs> uh, that's a decimal value. Uh, and which we'll get to in a second. Um, we have our list, also known as array. I'm not going to say arrays here because that's some of the language says. I'm treating them equally. Like I'm going to get there. If you know what goes off right now, that's fine. Um, and I don't think I'm forgetting anything from the rules, right? And float only on the list. I think that's everything. Double check that. I think that would be all of it. Oh, and string. There, there you go. See, for that one. I wrote all of them. Okay, so those are the data types that you want to know. If you have already used index, that's an integer. Um, we've already used float, which is our double values there. And I uh, yeah, see, I'm still thinking about it. decimal values. And then um, string, which uh, my word currently holds a string. Okay. So that's what a variable can hold for our purposes here. And any, any data that we're looking with will be one of those things. Sure. Um, um, it doesn't in C sharp, and I expect it doesn't in Java in Python either. But let me double check to remind myself just to answer your question here. Um, if I go uh, int, which I think is lower than casting here, uh, 4.5. I have that. Does it like that, first of all? Oh, it doesn't like that. Okay. <laughs> I guess the question is, I'm not sure. Um, we're not going to have to do an int cast here. I can tell you that. In normal language, what we're doing is we're casting to an int, but we're placing a float into an int box, is we are just cutting off the part of it that doesn't store in memory, right? So it should just, I, I won't say round down because it's a negative number, it should just chop off the decimal part. That's how it works in C sharp. Um, that's not going to be on the test, but um, I'd have to know the syntax for specifically casting and what I expected to work did not work. So maybe it helps a little check. That's what I expect. Yeah, because that's how the string went down. So, yeah, so, so no, they won't round it will cut off the decimal part if you wanted to cast to an end. So, again, uh, not on the test, so that's okay. Question. W3 scrolls for Python references from location as the. That's a short term for that, yeah. I don't think of it as what's happening, but a truncation is the official term for what's happening there. I like to think of it as it's it's trying to put the throat into the into box, and, and so it's just jamming it in there, right? So anything that wouldn't store in memory, because the reason that um, a decimal value is normally called a double, if you were curious, a little trivia here, um, is because it takes up twice as much space in memory as a typical integer, which makes sense because we've got all the same values before the decimal point, and then just as many values after the decimal point. So that's why it's a double, is what I think about it. Um, a floating point value, for instance, a float we're working with here, um, basically refers to a less precise value where it's going to store a certain amount of memory and the, you know, where each digital store is going to shift, as I best understand it. Okay, um, so those are our data types. That's what we care about. Um, one thing that's no longer 
covered on the test here, but it's worth knowing the bunch of control yarn output because we looked at some strings and stuff here. It's what we call an escape sequence. Um, the most common one is going to be the to write a new line inside of your string so that you don't have to like write a bunch of different print statements. Okay, um, so really quickly, I'll make a short note of that. We used to have a free response question um, that used escape sequences, and it was introduced there in the concept, but it was confusing to students, so we kind of cut that and, in fact, all free response questions entirely. But as you are hopefully experimenting with Python leading up to the test, it's a helpful thing to know because it helps you really understand your print statements and strings. So I will put that in here. Um, a string can contain an escape sequence. It's common uh, slash n, which is underline, underline, wait, hold on, and slash t, which is tab, space. Just to show that off here, and then we'll say no more of it for now. Um, I'm going to put a backslash n in my quotes here. Um, I'm going to say lines in a string. I'm going to put a backslash t or tab. That will help us clean up our output a little bit because right now it's all kind of jammed together. Um, so if I run that, what I get is an empty line right with the backslash N, and I get a small tab, maybe I can put a couple of tabs there to show you it a little bit better. Put that. So anyway, you put that on a string, you'll notice on here it gets, well, maybe you can see it, it gets a special color for the escape sequence because that's considered one character collectively. Um, if you happen to put that in a string, backslash N or backslash T, it will have that related effect. immediately goes to the next line, that's ST tabs it over. So if I run it again, you kind of see what that looks like. I have an empty space here because I put the backslash N at the beginning of that string, and then I have tabs because I put the backslash T's here. Okay, that's really the last thing about strings. That's it's pretty much trivia for the sake of this test, but it's worth knowing as you're developing yourself. Okay. There are other escape sequences. I encourage you to look up a list of them. So I'm going to do some pretty interesting stuff, but those are the ones that commonly come up in controlling output. Okay. There's my calculators. So um, this is your basic. That's, that was that was unit one of my class, by the way. Um, this is how we do on Toyboy. That's okay. It only takes the longest because I'm introducing programming. Um, this is your basic arithmetic, as you expect. It pretty much operates the way that. Um, you think it will. We've got our basic operators here, plus, minus, multiply, divide. You can use any numerical values together and it won't be a problem for you. So um, we will go ahead and say, let's start with the variable for good measure. So we'll say, um, I'll reuse x. We'll say x equals um, 7 plus 2, something like that. And then we'll print. Um, Seven plus two equals, and then we'll do that star. But then escape sequence in the beginning of this just for consistency. Put that nice notch in there so we can get some space in our output. And then we have it right there. I have to actually hold the mouse down for it go. It stops highlighting. Boom. Maybe if I hit enter, I don't know. Okay, so um, this pretty much do what you expect. This is your addition. This is, per se, we'll just reuse x again. Um, so I'm not going to use a variable this time. We'll just print it right in line. Um, so we'll do subtraction. We'll say print um, 8 minus 20 equals, and then we'll go stir 8 minus 20. It has no problem with negatives. Okay. That's like this negative 12 and I'll put down there. Um, the multiply is say 16 times 15. You're still there, it's like concatenating. Run that 
There we go. So we have one processor power in unit one and unit two we get um, so that's exciting. <laughs> then it starts to get interesting. And then, so um, those three operate exactly how you would expect. One thing I will say, and, and this is featured on the test, so be aware of this, division works a little differently in a programming class compared to a math class. Let me make sure that's the case in um, I'm just to be sure, because I know that, that some of the subtleties can be a little bit different. So if it's a seven divided by two, I don't think it's going to cast these to a slope for me. I believe since those are both ints, but let's find out. I want to make sure. Oh, that's okay. Okay. That doesn't matter. It just covers that for us. So this is what we expect. Interesting. All right. So, so let's hear about your functionality, essentially. Those are your four operators. That's addition, subtraction, there. this is your multiplication, and this is your division. I think it for us. Divide, divide. Mm -hmm. Let's divide, uh, divide. <laughs> two, works for me. We have two, two divisions of this thing. Yeah, okay. Well, that's not one of the things, so I will ignore it completely. Thanks. Yeah, I'm on the way. It's a good point. Anyway, um, that, that won't be on the, uh, the test, so I'm not going to respond to that question. Um, when do you have to cast to spring in your print statement? I'm trying to figure out how to do that. That part is that. Is that going to work for you? So if I get rid of this, it's going to work okay. Nope, didn't like it. Um, so, if I get rid of this, it doesn't like it for me. You have to take out the field. No. No, I didn't want to search you with this. I don't know if the H. Still doesn't like it. Where's the error? Yeah, I still think you have to cast that because it's a. Oh, it's not a string. You have a plus time. Oh, sure, with the comma. Yeah. I, I just do concatenation with the plus. So, anytime you're concatenating, I guess, is the answer. Good question. Um, when do you have to pass to a string? When you're concatenating with the string. Yeah. That's the way I would treat it because I've always found it to be the simplest thing. It uh, gives you more control over the output. Now, if you want to mess around with print statements with your commas instead, um, then by all means. That won't be able to cast, but because it's just like, okay, if I remember that if it's a number and I'm concatenating, I need to put store in front of it, that seems easier to me personally. Okay, cool. Um, to that end, one of the operations, uh, this is our MDOS from elementary school. Um, parentheses come with. Parentheses are really important in programming because they, they tell you what's going to happen first. And that doesn't just apply to arithmetic, it applies to any sort of evaluation. Okay, um, so, so I'll pass and then parentheses uh, work from the inside out. So pretty much what you expect from algebra. So here if I say um, my value equals um, six times four minus eight divided by two, then so we're in operations here. It's going to uh, tackle the parentheses first. Inside the parentheses, I've got division comes before subtraction. Um, so 4 minus 5 gives me negative 1, then finally multiplying, giving me negative 6. And it's printing as negative six point out specifically because division gave me a full value, but that's fine. Students will have access to the compiler here. So if there are any questions on the multiple choice test during the test where it says, hey, what output did this give me? They are more than welcome and encouraged, in fact, to put that one into the compiler so they can see the result. I'll give them the right answer. Okay. Uh, if your students are familiar with the, the PEMDAS, Abbreviation there, it'd be worthwhile to spend a little bit of time reviewing that. 
um, as they saw that. But at the same time, they also just punched up things that got uh, the compiler, treat it like a calculator, and get the result of it. And that's time too. So it's not question. This could be a recording so you can look at it uh, after today. Yes, this will be recorded. It's currently recording, as far as I know. A red circle seems promising. Okay. So um, the search for variables just as well as numbers. Remember, the variables are just stand-ins for the values that they hold. So anything with um, variables in it. So if I say x equals eight, okay, no, not that. Okay, there. Yeah. Y equals negative 15.5 and z equals uh, 54, for instance. And then I would print um, s minus x times x plus x divided by 2 plus y times Z, something like that. It'll give me a value. I don't have that value memorized. It's 629, obviously, as we know. So you can treat these just like numbers. You can use them interchangeably as long as your variables hold numeric values. That would be answer flows. Generally, it's better to print things with context. Um, I'm not going to do that in the interest of time, but um, you know, having your output say, that's what I was doing might be helpful, but you can reflect to it here. That's fine. So, uh, Variables anywhere you can use the values. Important principle of variables. They give you a lot of power in your programming. Okay, I guess that was unit two. Cool. So now we got variables, so I might have still written unit one. I mean, unit two was strings, so I kind of did it backwards. That's okay. All right. Um, so, what you should notice here is that all your programs are going to start the top of your code and go down and go line by line. Um, and that's what we've got so far. The variable values will change if you update them. You'll notice I, I used X several times throughout my code here. Let me scroll up a little bit so you can see that. Um, I had X up here was 11, and X down here was became nine, and then I had X became eight down here. Um, that value stays in place inside what we call the program flow, which is the order that we're doing things in, you know, the lines of code that are written, um, until you change it. So for this whole portion of code, well, starting here, I guess, after it, X is nine, um, and then for this as well, and then I get down to here and X becomes eight. So X is eight when I'm in this section of the code, X is nine. So keeping track of variable value is really important. No questions about what's the value of the variable at this moment. Um, so make sure you practice with you know, seeing what that's, that's the logical thinking aspect of this. Um, part of that programming uses manipulatives um, is the idea that it teaches problem solving in a way that math really struggles with. In, in math, you're going to learn a lot of really good logical thinking and programming obviously covers that because we're tracking how to follow this step by step, right? In, um, programming, and the reason that I think it probably eventually overtakes math in use education at some point um, in another 50 years or so, who knows? The, the wheels turn slowly. Um, this teaches the problem solving skills, like the, the lateral thinking skills. Students tend to not love story problems, um, but once they know the basics of programming, writing up a program to say, well, I'm here, how do I want to get to here? I have to write the steps and figure them out just seems to be a little more engaging for them in general, in my experience, but whatever that's worth. I'm qualified to say that because I'm a math teacher and a programming teacher. <laughs> okay. um, so everything we've done you know, in terms of the program flow here has happened nice and orderly thus far. Um, starting down here with our conditional statements, we get to control the order a little bit differently. Um, so the first of those is this concept of Boolean values. In the name of uh, George Boole, is a pioneer in logical arithmetic and understanding, like making truth tables and things like that. Um, so he got to name the data type after himself. That's, I mean, try and pioneer something. You can, you can name stuff. Scientists love to do that. Mathematicians too, apparently. So um, these billion values uh, is just a fancy way of saying true or false. <laughs> How can you copyright that? I will never know. That's impressive. I'm sure they existed before then. 
And so when value is true or that the caps as our board modes in programming the false. As I said, Boolean is one of the data types that we work with here with our variables. So you can say, like, x equals true or x equals false, whatever. I'm using x a lot, but this is my key for I guess it's capital T true if I want the key letter. That's brilliant. Um, sorry, I'm trying to just bring that back for a second. X is a Boolean. With a value, the value of I think I still have to straight test this because a boolean is not a string. Even though it says true, we have value of that. Didn't like that. I didn't like that. Um, oh shoot! You're right. Thank you. Are you getting that for me? Stupid. It's basic, literally. There's my truth. If you output it, you get that. Um, Boolean values are useful in what we call conditional statements, also known as if statements. This is where you get power over programs. Um, it says, I'm going to run this next part of code, or I'm not, depending on whether the condition that I make is true or false. So for that, we need to be able to check whether something is true or false. So um, we'll say, if else, um, if else stuff. Uh, if the Boolean value is true, run the next part of code. Otherwise, stick it. So here we would say, um, if, and here's how we write a the code in Python. Um, we have a whole statement that has to be. Okay. I'm going to have to remember that every time, so I'm just going to put all these back in. So <laughs> okay. That way I won't tell over it because I'm going to um, We say if x, and then we put a colon here to show I'm talking about this stuff here. So uh, if x, say print uh, if statement. I printed that because X is true. If I have another value here that says uh, Y equals false, and it's my boolean now here. And I'm going to say it's Y. Y is true. That and we run that and it's still entirely. So for the first time, we sort of controlled program flow here. It's not running that piece of code. Um, that block of code will continue as long as this is tabbed over, indented right here. Indentation matters in Python to my eternal consternation. <laughs> so uh, this block of code continues um, as long as it uh, continues. How about Y invented? How about that? Let's go with So, my boolean values are my true and falses. They're used in these if statements here. Um, it's not as simple, and most of the time, you won't just say it's true or it's false. Usually, you will have something that evaluates to either true or false. So, that's where we get into our next set of operators, which is boolean operators. We're doing great on time, honestly. Um, so, um, operators. Uh, these are the ones that you've also seen in algebra class. So, your greater than, your less than, that sort of thing. Um, so, we have greater than, less than, well, greater than, greater than or equal to takes two keystrokes there. Um, less than, less than or equal to. And then you've got. Sign for is equal to. I don't think double equal sign is because we've already used the equals for signing a value. It works differently than in a mass class. So, um, is value uh, x equals x plus one is a valid statement in code, but a math teacher can't stand it at all. So, yeah. 
second. Um, and then the last one that we'll work with here is exclamation point equals. That's the opposite of is equal to. It's is not equal to. Let's compare two values and um, results in true values. So we will have some values here. We'll go A and B this time. A equals six. B equals negative hundred. Um, so we can say other statements. We can just put those boolean expressions that evaluate the true or false inside the parentheses here. So if A is greater than B, then we can say print star a greater than star b. And we've got uh, one more keyword here, which is else. The else comes after an if every time. It's right after that block of code ends. And it's if the if statement didn't run, I'm going to do this other thing. So else print uh, a is an equal to star b. And then the notes here. Um, comes after and if lock and runs if the yes so the else is sort of your contingency if this doesn't run then this runs so what we have here for our output is the first one because this is true and the six is negative 100, and the six is greater than negative 100, so we get this output and it skips the else. We extend that a little further to have multiple conditional statements sort of chained together. Um, with this, we have the, the logic is if, else, if, and then you can have as many else ifs as you want, and then perhaps you end it in else. Um, the keyword for that in Python, so to say, if um, a times b is greater than zero, and we'll print a times b positive. And uh, it's this. That's short for else if. Like, okay. <laughs> oh, if, sorry, that needs a condition. Um, A times B equals zero. We'll say print A times B is zero. And then else we'll come at the end of that, and I'll print. Times B is negative. So I'll put in the note here because that's the new thing. Um, this checks this condition. This condition of the was false. That's a fine way of putting it. So the way this one works is it will check this first. If this is true, it's going to skip all the rest of this, and it's going to run this block of code. If this is false, it's going to get to the next one and check this. And then if it's true, it will run this block of code. And if that's false, it's going to get down here and run the else. So in this case, uh, A is 6 and B is negative 100. So um, it should run else here because this is false and this is false. Times B is negative. Right. If I change the values up a little, 
you can see different results here. So um, I encourage you on your own time to mess with some of these values and run this code and just change the values a bit and see what happens. Um, here, if I change it to uh, six and positive 100, it will run the first statement there. It tends to be positive. That's here. Um, and if I change this one to zero, then it will run the next statement here. Because eight times three is not greater than zero, it's equal to zero, so it runs this one and then skips the last. So that's your if that was logic. So if that's if. Okay, that's unit three. Well, I have my students do you know, a bunch of programming assignments in between each lesson. It's tough to squeeze those into two hours. Uh, so that's the primer on that stuff. Again, I encourage you to use W3 schools for any of these things that are not making sense. They've got sort of lessons in there that can cover whatever it is you need to, to understand for up to the test. This is just an introduction for complete beginners. Okay, um, now that we have this conditional logic in place, we have these expressions that are evaluating to a boolean, true or false. We can use that to run code multiple times. Um, this is called a loop. There are two different kinds of loops that we care about in Python, and most of them are language I with, and those are for loops and while loops. Um, the while loop is probably simpler, so I'm just going to put that one first here, because the while loop is essentially just a um, but uh, it's a if statement on repeat. So uh, if I say x equals one, I'm going to say y x is less than five. So again, this is if this were an if statement, uh, it would run. Right. Um, but while this is less than five, we want to print uh, x. And then we want to make sure that x goes up. So x. Uh, I say plus plus in Python, can I? Does it like that? No, it doesn't like that. Go for it. And then the increment operator in Python, it must be one, right? Plus equal. So an increment operator. Fine. Mm -hmm. It's equals x plus one. I don't want to. I don't think we have it. It's like side note that is on the scope. I think it's either equals plus or plus equals. Oh, no, this is okay. <laughs> I think it is plus equals, but it can't be very plus equals and then increment. Yeah, but I mean it's not the increment operator. That's just as an examine operator for addition. Like, yeah, I mean x plus plus. That's x plus plus is where it's at. I guess they don't lose it in Python. It's sad. Said. Um, arithmetic assignment operators are not in the scope of the test, so I won't go plus equals here. Um, it's you know, useful, certainly, but you can write this much, no problem. One thing I want to say about the sort of assignment operator that I mentioned earlier equals um, it evaluates the entire right side of that expression and then stores it in the variable on the left. That's the way the assignment operator works. So uh, when I say x equals x plus one, again, that wouldn't make any sense in a math class whatsoever. Um, in a programming class, it says, well, it's x plus one. I'm going to evaluate that. So in this case, my first time through, I get two. And then I'm going to update this thing on the left. Okay. So here's what happened here. X started at one. So uh, while loops uh, function as essentially an if statement on repeat. This runs. As the condition is true, I should say as long as runs if the condition is true, then checks the condition again. In other words, okay, that's why it's important in these uh, loops to change the value of the to reach that condition so it's eventually false, otherwise your loop is going to go infinite, and uh, that's not what anybody wants. So here, x is 1, well, x is less than 5, it's true the first time, I'm printing x, there's my 1 in my out there, and then I'm adding 1 to x, so it goes 
X is one, then X is two, then X is three, then X is four. X becomes five, and then this is no longer true, so the loop is all finished. Okay, it's a new statement that goes again and again and again. Make sure to uh, have a way to get the conditions to false eventually. You just want to print forever. Throw some kind of error. So that's on while loops. There are questions um, on the test about like here's the more complicated questions are like here's a while loop. What's the value of this variable after the while loop is finished? We have that a few questions on the test. So be aware of that. Um, you, this is just pure logical thinking, like can you track? What I recommend doing um, if you are trying to do these by hand and strengthen your logical thinking is write down the value and track the program thing and see what happens. This, these Y loops are going to go again and again and again until that condition is false. So if you keep track of the value as you go, you'll have a better understanding of the logic behind it. Right. Otherwise, I suppose you can just put the code in with the compiler and see what the end result is, but you want to be able to understand it ideally. Okay, so that is your primer on Y loops. One element of maybe one more loop example. One element of strings that I didn't cover up above is um, strings know their own length, and that may be used on questions on the test. So I want to keep that because that's an aspect of strings that's pretty common, and strings are covered here. So um, let's do a let's say um, b equals. Uh, Something like that. Okay. And we'll say while little n b, it's n b, right? Okay. Yeah, so okay. n b uh, is less than 10. And the string is the length of the string. That's important for you. So we will print B and then we will um, add uh, something to the end of B just to eventually get to that place. So we'll say uh, B equals B plus, just concatenating, um, and we'll add another G to it. Okay. So while we're to B is less than 10, we're going to run this, we're going to print B, which starts at coding in all caps, and then we're going to add a G to the end of it. So if I run that, there's that's an result. We would have had too much sugar. Okay. Once we get to here, it gets another G at the end of it, so um, we would be coding with five Gs at this point, but the length of that is not less than 10, so um, it's false, which means the loop is finished. If I change this to a less than or equal to, by the way, we'll run one more time because now the 10 is still true, and then you know, it'll go to 11. So there's that. Just to mix in some different operators here. Okay. So that's your while loops. Again, if you think like an if statement on repeat, you won't go too wrong. It just goes and goes and goes until that condition becomes false when it checks it. All right, uh, four loops are made for counting. This is for going a certain amount of times. Um, so, let's say, uh, so the four loop is a counting loop. Nope, that's sticky keys. I don't, I hope I didn't turn them on. Oh no, <laughs> I may have. Can I turn it off? The button shift for too long. I'm going to get a read better time. <laughs> Code a certain number of times. Typical thing is I've seen it in Python um, uses the range function. So it's uh, for like a in range, um, and then we say what we want it to be as we go. So if we say we go from one to uh, ten, 
then maybe I print so that'll automatically go from one through ten. I will say it actually ends at nine because it's exclusive on the high side. So that's worth knowing. But we're running, you can see the that in action. There's my one, two, nine, not ten. So it's just printing high. I goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, its range is exclusive. Um, and isn't included. Ah. So it goes up to nine, it counts up for us. It's counting it. One to nine printed. I'm going to check my practice questions here because obviously there's a way to make them count by ones, but I don't know if that's included with the test off the top of my head. So I won't confuse it with that if that's not on here. Just my four loops. Well, I think we're just using the basic range for our four loops. So don't go ahead. Anything that's not counting by ones, let's we'll stick with that. Okay. You don't have to put a high in this loop, you could do whatever you want, and it's just going to happen a certain number of times. In this case, nine times. That's what I've got to say about loops. Let's move on. Ooh, we're not too far off. Good, wonderful. Okay, um, arrays or this is a more commonly known in Python. They, they provide the same functionality for our purposes. I was using the C sharp language. Somebody asked the question in the, the coaches meeting. Are we talking about lists? Because Python doesn't explicitly include support for arrays. That's true. I kept the arrays language in this time, um, but yeah, we're talking about lists here. When we declare them, it's going to work the same way. Um, there's a plugin for Python that you can use to work with arrays, but I mean, functionality is essentially the same. So when I say arrays, take their lists. If, if you like, if you're fancy. Um, if you think of them as well, you won't go too wrong. They function the same way for us. Um, okay, so um, what is an array for our purposes? See, now I hate that I'm saying arrays. Oh, whatever. It says arrays on the test, so I'm going to say arrays for today. And then maybe next year we'll change it to lists. Right. Our variables, our values, can store those individual values that we had earlier any int, float, string, boolean, or which one did I forget? There are five of them. <laughs> is right on that? No, I spread it for you guys. <laughs> there you go. 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 Or you can store a series of data values of the same type, and that would be a list or an array. Okay. Um, so uh, an array is a collection array or list is a collection of values of the same type. They don't have to be the same type in Python, don't they? Yeah, just no, they can be a different never mind then. Thank you. <laughs> values. That's what differentiates them. Oh, really? Oh, I believe. I might teach you the eyes. Just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Just So, uh, is a collection of values. I guess if they're an array, they have to be the same type. I believe you. That's fine. It doesn't, like, for our purposes, all matter. I'm not going to throw a list of different types of values. So, for that reason, I can say that. Um, the same as a race. Really great. Um, so if I say now my, I've been using X a lot, um, let's say um, my array equals, and then I just put what I want to go in it in square braces separated by commas. So um, let's say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, storing the uh, things here, Thursday. This is an Array of eh, I don't know, space. <laughs> an array of strings with square braces. That's these guys uh, separated by commas. That's my syntax there. 
Okay, so now I have an array of five strings. Monday through Friday. Um, when we are numbering those values in our array, it's zero based. So instead of starting counting at one, we start counting at zero. That's an important concept in programming. Um, there are very good reasons for that. That's what I would say about it. I go on a tangent with my students about like the origin and zero based indexing, about how computers actually work, but sidebar. Um, it's, it's worth knowing. You should look it up. It's like just Google why I do. <laughs> Why does counting in programming start at zero and you will be given <laughs> information you don't want for the rest of your computer's life? <laughs> so, uh, in this um, each value in the array has an index, which is its position, starting at zero, that is zero based indexing. So we can say, we can print the whole array, I believe, and it will give us that's what we stored there. I think I can handle that. Let's find out. Yeah, just the array as I have it there. Or we can print individual values from the array. So we'll say uh, print um, the third value is, and we'll say, my array at index two. That's indexing with square braces. Okay, so that's how you index as an individual value in your array by its position by its index. The third value is Wednesday. So it's zero, one, two, three, four. Do we still get the runtime exception if we try to index out of bounds? We do, right? Surely. Okay, good. If I tried to say five, because I'm thinking, no, there's five values. This is the fifth value. That's not correct, is it? Right? The fifth value is position four. There is no position five, so we'll try to do that. It crashes my program. Even though it's not a syntax error, it is a runtime error. So it's be aware of that. Index out of range. There you go. All right, so don't do that. The third value is position two. Another handy thing for combining some ideas here is we can use a loop to do something to all of the uh, positions in an array or list. So um, we have our numerical indexes here. We're going to maybe go ahead and do something to each one. So we'll say we will traverse the array using a loop. Okay. Say so for I in range, and the range for this starts at zero. I mean, it is exclusive on the high side, so you can automatically know the last valid position in any list by saying the length minus one. When my array. Yeah. So, uh, then of your array. Here's the length of the array, just like a string. The last valid position is always length minus one. Say it again. Um, so this will go from zero to four in this case. Because this is exclusive on my side. That's a loop of ranges. So we will say. Array at index and because we like weekends, we're going to change them both to Saturday. And after the loop, a new array. See the results. Well, oh, what's it? It didn't like once again. Oh, shoot. Why did I send that then? What's the link to the array? And cut up one. Link to the array, I get it, out of the list or whatever. It has it, doesn't it? <laughs> I can't cast the. I don't want the length of any other strings on the length of the list itself. Hold on, look at that. It's got to be in there. 
length of a list Python. That's exactly how I put it. Hmm. Yeah, where is it? Where is it? Oh, you have to close one more time before. Okay, there. Where's my other? Minus one on it. It's not a lot of bounds thing. This is exclusive on the high side, so I wanted to go from zero to four the length is five, so that makes big four is just the parentheses. I think you, the, the outermost parentheses are unnecessary. But that closes my my third header. Just the four loops need that. I don't think it does. Doesn't it? I don't know. I had it up in my head. No, that wasn't there. No, no that's that wasn't there. It's still angry. Yeah, why is it angry? Should work. Oh, really? Yeah. So it looks like your problem is 109 now. But it wasn't there. Oh, well. Are you right, Mid-Eddy? I cast this to a string. Okay, I might have shut you down too quickly. No, it doesn't matter either. You know, your encapsulation is fine. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I don't have an assistant in here, but I appreciate it. Anyway, there we go. Okay, got it. Um, yeah, for concatenating, I still need to concatenate to a string. Whoever said that in the back is right. So apologies for, I thought you were talking about up here. Um, and okay, I'm good. Yeah. So I changed them all on Saturday, by the way. That's why I accomplished this. I traversed the array. I changed every element to Saturday because that's how it should be. In a post world society. <laughs> cool, we got that. Okay, so use that uh, one more time to this because the logic can be a little disorienting. Um, I had my array which had these values initial. Um, I printed it just to prove that I could. I traversed the array, meaning I went to each spot in it. Um, and by doing this right here, okay, my i value went from zero up through. The length of the list minus one because range is exclusive on the high side. It doesn't include the, the length value, which is five. Okay, so on zero, one, two, three, four. And then I changed my array on index i to Saturday for each of those. This ran five times, changed everything to Saturday. Then I printed it, little we'll string cast, put concatenation, right? And this is what I ended up getting. Okay, that's about as complicated as it's going to get on a test like this. Um, we, we do have questions that are that complicated. Um, all of them, certainly. The way the test is structured, they're going to be easy, medium, and hard questions. I would consider a question like this a hard question. Wait a second. That was the same amount of points, though. So, yeah. And some easy questions first. Okay, good. We got that. So, that's how you can use every form to traverse an array. Um, when I say traverse, that's a word I just threw out there. Uh, visit each index in. <laughs> Okay, cool. Thank you for the help on that. I just appreciate it. All right. All right. Last thing that I've got in my outline here, and then we can take some questions, maybe do a couple more examples if anything in here was unclear. Um, I think we'll have a good amount of time for that stuff. So, ready and calling functions. Um, this is the last topic listed here. Um, so functions I consider to be the second big pillar of programming of the three of them, variables being the first um, and classes being the third, but Python is not very strongly object oriented. So the classes thing is not covered in, in this uh, lesson. Um, and Python, I've used Python for other classes and the support for it is really good. It's fun. Um, geez, the way you call constructors, I love my goodness. Question. So we have a paper test um, on the day of, I believe we're looking at 30 questions for that thing. Um, and it will be a mix of easy, medium, and hard questions. So part of the skill set on the test is kind of figuring out which one's which as you go, so you don't run out of time. Are you still going to show an example of the interactive exercise today? No, we were never going to do that today. Um, it's for, for the interactive portion, um, we gave some advice during the coaches workshop and then the test itself a bit here and said probably the best lateral thinking trainer, the problem solving skill, it was a game called Baba is You. We linked it on the website. It's not a free game, but it's very much worth the seven dollars that it costs. Um, and this is the kind of thing that like 
adults can plan for a great time with and kids can use as a real smartness trainer. Um, so definitely recommend that one. It's not identical to what we did in the interactive program, um, but the best way to be prepared for that one is to come to one of the practice exams because we had a practice version of it that only kids who come to the practice event will be able to see. But that said, um, there are things on there that would be very uh, obvious to students on how to do. Oh, not today. with the free response portion of the event. This is more, it's closer to a game than a, um, a test. That part of it is the questions. Okay. Yes. So when you refer to the practice event, is that the one coming up here in March? Yeah, I'm not sure about all the dates off the top of my head. It might be like the second, like the Chippewa Valley. Okay. I'll be in attendance at most of those, if not all of them. Of the practice events. Okay. Last topic here functions. Um, so for our functions here, you can think of it as you writing a block of code that can be called at any time from normal program flow. It's not going to run on its own unless you use its name to say, hey, run this code. Okay. So um, here's my working definition a function is a block of code that can be called to run using its name. This is separate from a normal program flow. Um, we can call it from web. Okay. Uh, we define a function using DS, ref keyword. Um, we give a function a name. So the standard in Python, in case, first there. Yeah. Okay. C sharp has me uh, <laughs> capital letters for methods. This is what we it's, I'm sure it's not necessary, but again, I was just so forgiving of syntax, you know, generally. Um, I define my method. So we have this, it's a block of code like the stuff that we have up above with these codes. Um, this is called a header, by the way. This is a method header that goes to the top. Um, we've had headers before for our little loops. Anything that goes with a colon at the end of it is considered a header. For our statements, we had headers, while loops. Okay, this is our method header. Um, I put that in the notes up here. Uh, this any anything in a loop here. That any I don't know, this is a loop header. Yeah. Anyway, call it at the end of it. It's going to be header for our purposes. I think I can generally say that. Okay. Um, we'll just print. So we'll keep it a very simple method. We'll print uh, my method. It was called. I like that. We can put a slash end at the beginning of it. Just remind you. I don't think it's going to run. Okay. So if I run this normally, uh, it does not run. I've got my same output as before. However, now that I have something called my method, I can call it up here in my normal program flow. I can just say my method, like so. And I am calling call the separate method. And then it's going to run that thing for us. As long as my call. Oh, uh, no, I like that. Okay. Um, let's put that at the top then. Let me cut all that. The first thing you learn by any means, in fact, the last thing you learn, but you have to define them. It doesn't matter. It's a bit old Python, honestly. Okay, I'll put that up here. Yeah. Same code, because it's part of your heads. Razza, Razza. Do the methods anyway in C sharp. Okay, let's try that again. Thank you again for being on top of that and the coding experts in the room. Okay, yeah. okay. so before that method did not run, the code that I had up there with the header on it didn't run. Now it has run. So that's a simple method. We didn't give it any information to work with. Um, an advantage of methods, other than getting a block of code to run whenever you want it to, and that includes like inside a loop, for instance, we can get it run a bunch of times, um, is that you can pass it information. We can set it up to receive some information, um, which is called an argument, the information we send it. And we can call it multiple times with different information, which is really useful. Um, so it was, uh, we can find another method. I'm going to this time. There you go. Time my code, let me know if it's good. 
define um, really all the methods. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to specify some parameters here. That's what we call the information that this method will receive. So um, we have this taken that is called X and what we're going to do is we're going to print a message X plus Y equals Okay, so that's my method I defined here. It's going to print the result of whatever values that I gave it when I called it. X and Y are parameters for the method we'll receive. For years, I treated parameters and arguments the same way. Um, I used the language there, and then I had one student who was like the son of an engineer give me that. Well, actually, then my dad says they're not the same thing, and I'm like, I have to look at them. Okay, technically, you're right. <laughs> it's a very close definition. It's two way. It's two sides of looking at the same thing. I will never forget that. He was such a jerk about it. <laughs> He was right, though. Okay, so there's my method at the time that's going to print the sum of those two numbers. So we go all the way back down here. We're going to, um, we're going to let's say, we're going to add these with this uh, and eight and five arguments we send to the method. You can see why I said arguments and parameters like are functionally the same thing. It's, but arguments are the information we send to it. Parameters are the information that thing receives. Here, they're the same thing, but you're looking at it from different sides. So technically, they're different. So bad. And then, so we run that, we get, oh, I said x plus y equals y. I should have used the values. My method wasn't very well written. Let's do this instead. So I said X and Y, but that's not correct. Let me fix that. I want to do some more concatenation here with this. So X plus so Y. Yes, yeah, that's better. But the actual value is not just X and Y as a string. Let's try that again. Good catch. Better than a compiler. Good job. There's a lot more running code frequently, by the way, because you can you can do a mess of this and just yeah you know, have an oversight that's going to mess up the whole program. There you go. Plus five equals thirteen. That's better. The natural question here is: Why are they having functions in? Because I could have just put this line of code anywhere. Right? Um, consider that this. Method can do as many things as I want it to do. It's a block of code. It can be as long as you want it to be. And I can call it some or other, giving it different values. So um, down here, say, we can run it again with, um, with some variables this time. Let's say x equals uh, 10. Let's say y equals 11. And we'll add these with x and y this time. My method works again with these different values. So use your imagination here a little bit and consider that the method could have been very complicated and used those values. Now I have to write it code again. I write it once, I give it different information, it does what I need it to do. Methods are really powerful. Sorry, I said methods. I said uh, I should call functions uh, methods and functions. I think I can interchangeably use those words. So I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said method. Let me change this. Let me change my other function every time. Here. No. That's badly spelled. Um, function by function, concept of function, there we go. We sent to the function. We're ready to change the name of the function. Sorry. C sharp keeping in again. The advantage of Python is it, it's probably among the easiest languages to learn, and it's also the most popular language these days. It's overtaken the others um, in business, as far as I understand. Um, the downside of it is if you're a programmer, some of the changes to the language and syntax that make it so slippery 
a really annoying yeah yeah that's why we use it here yeah. it'd, be, it'd be harder to learn c sharp as a first language i think the last one my function function there we go i think i call them oh, no wait. function better okay cool so we got it. There we go. My function was cool. My method. That's another name for functions, by the way. <laughs> okay. So you could define whatever functions you wanted up top, and then you can call them with any information. As long as you call this and send it the two pieces of information it needs, then you are good. Okay, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, this essentially, I guess this wouldn't be the full year of my class because that would include um, some game design stuff and some um, uh, object oriented stuff that Python doesn't cover, but this was definitely at least a full semester of my class in a different language. So, <laughs> did it about an hour and 24, so that's not bad. Okay, um, we've got upwards of 30 minutes to answer questions, to go over anything again, um, and to clarify. So, all the way in the back, please speak loudly. Uh, the question was, what's the difference between method and function? Um, I would say they're the same thing. Can, can someone refute me on that? It's just another word for the same syn synonymous. Okay, yeah. Methods are functions, it's the same thing. The language on the test should all say functions, okay? <laughs> Sorry, in some languages they prefer the, the in programming you have a lot of different languages, right? And those different languages, programmers can be very particular people, and a lot of the time they will use different names to mean the same thing, but they prefer it for their language. So for instance, I teach C sharp and Java, those languages are 85 to 90 percent the same thing, right? But there are just a couple little differences that are really annoying when I'm trying to teach Java. Um, so, so just uh, you'll see multiple words that mean the same thing. One of the other genre classes you have uh, attributes versus properties. They mean the same thing, but one language uses one, one language uses the other. Here, methods versus functions, same thing. Okay, good question. Question here. Maybe. 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 Technical thing you could say. Yes. Methods would be described as a function with its class. I think that. Well, we write static methods. methods in those. Yeah. No, I mean, if you're looking at like. The Python WC3 or WC3 tool. I think they might define methods as functions within classes. Outside of classes? I mean, you just wrote a function from the main loop, essentially. It's inside to be one like main class, right? Yeah, but if you're looking at like, like if you looked at what a method was, they might say that it's a, a function that goes within a class. I will still say I was correct to say methods are actually the same because that's very technical. That's not as bad as, as parameters versus arguments. Those actually are different things. Just very subtle differences, you know. This I can't. I can't find that. You know, if you're looking at it, that's fair. If you're what it yeah. does, if I return that it's part of a value. Talk to this guy afterwards if you really want to know. <laughs> okay. Um, what else did we want covered more? I can give more examples. I can answer questions. Okay. Like more about for tuples. Um, that's not covered in the scope of this. Um, we're just using lists, which are arrays. Again, for all purposes, functionally the same. Question here. When you're running, you're running like, you've got 100 plus lines of the code. Is it running everything in there? Or does it start at a certain point? Or can you specify? I want to really run this code. The question was if they're running a code, does it run everything? Or does it start at a certain point? The answer in general is it runs everything. We control the program flow a bit with our if statements with our loops and with our methods um, but it's going to start at the top of the regular code here that's not part of a method that we wrote um, this would be our main method functionally right um, this is so it's going to start right here and it's going to go until the program ends some of the code is going to be skipped because of our if statements when we have a boolean value returning false um, it's going to not run this because it sees that this header is false. So this doesn't get run, but generally it goes top to bottom. Um, and this way you super control. Good question. Question. Uh, is this or can you make this code like a 
or text available? Yes. I'm going to save this to a flash drive and make sure it's emailed to uh, the head show and we'll get it up on the website as a resource to go with the video. Yes. So, um, Matthew, I feel like you're a little bit of an American talking about Well, the students have access to the internet and are they talking about, you know, the way that I program is I Google how to do text. Specifically, they'll only have access to the compiler and they will have access to the sheet of notes that they bring in with them. They will not have full Google capabilities to say, how can I solve this problem? Um, so they have to have some knowledge coming in. Um, that said, unlike previous years, they don't actually have to do any coding in this event anymore. Um, they could get by without using the compiler if they can logically track the code in their in their heads and say, okay, this does this. The question is, what is the output and what's the value after this? I know it. They don't have to touch the compiler. Um, in previous years, we had the free response portion, which I teach AP computer science, and it was sort of modeled when I was setting this up a few years ago after the APCS exam that has a free response portion and multiple choice portion. Um, that free response portion is them writing code by hand with without external support. So it's like well, and have to all the questions and do that same concept to set students up for maybe that kind of a future. Um, it was too much for them. Uh, it was, it was uh, even when I made questions, have relatively, even if the first part of the question was like, print this value, students didn't even want to read the whole thing to get to that point. So we dumped that, and, and part of the reason I was able to do that, and credit to young men, but even Ben Dodge is probably the best student I've ever had. Hopefully, he doesn't watch this and get a big head about it. But um, he uh, worked with me to develop the interactive coding challenge as I sort of like laid it out for him to say, okay, we want something a little more dynamic in this event. Um, and then we sort of field tested it in last year's event. It was 20% of the test back then, um, and it went great. Students love getting their hands on it and they really understood. And there was enough challenge in it to say, okay, we can do some of these easy questions, but um, we're not going to be able to do everything on here. And that's exactly what we wanted. And so we used that this year to cut out the first response question entirely, add more multiple choice questions, and it's 50 50 now. Right, that's question. Um, any of the tests that you can access online? Yep. We'll have a response and then multiple choice of this code won't work. How much do we rely on that in this test for the children? Um, it may come up in the test here. I recommend using the compiler if they're not sure, because um, again, they'll have access to it. There will be a few questions like that. But just a few. Okay. Um, where, where that's the answer, but uh, we may have that this code, code won't work in one of the questions if. Yeah. Yeah, as a choice, as a possible choice. Question tools that you can access will have that many times this code will work. Yeah, I really have it in there. Um, it's not going to be in every question, um, but it's, it could be in quite a few of them. We want them to have a good understanding of at least recognizing the syntax and when it's inappropriate. Yes, question. Um, learning resources for high school academy is now in play. Uh, not even a free trial anymore. Yeah, I think that's a very worthy week spent. Honestly, um, trial of Code Academy. W3 Schools is a good thing. Um, Khan Academy has always been pretty reliable for any topic. Um, I'm not certain they have a Python course, but I'm guessing they do. And they have a bunch of free videos on YouTube. So uh, that's K H A M, I believe. Khan Academy. It's a fine resource there. What else? Questions about the test day itself, any procedures, or any of the content that we have there? Something you'd like to see another example? I've got to show another half an hour if we want to use it. Question in the back. Yes, I'm not. Um, you can bring information in um, to the test on that piece of paper. That's, that's sort of your cheat sheet, essentially. Um, if, if you wanted to embarrass my font, print all the code that I've written here on a piece of paper that is totally in bounds as a reference guide, right? Um, you don't require an overwhelming amount of information on the paper for the students, but um, you can if you like. <laughs> if they're really still minded. What else? 
I'm just going to take a quick look if you all don't have any other questions for me. I'm saying quick look at the practice questions from before. I know I've covered all of the topics here, but maybe I can um, find something in the practice questions that shows me some topic we could say more about. Maybe a more complicated one. Practice questions. There we go. Example part one questions from the website. These are all relatively simple, actually. Number five is pretty good. Okay, um, we'll do another live example here. Uh, ooh, wait, did I? Oh, wait, there's one more thing to cover. I didn't do return segments. Okay, let's get that in there because that is part of function definition. So, one more topic here. Um, let me write one more function. Um, um, let's say double this. Have it has number as the argument. This time, instead of printing the value, what we're going to do is we're going to send the information back to whatever called it. Okay, so uh, we do that using a return statement. So return here is a keyword that sends information back. We're giving information to that parameter, right? Um, or argument, if we call it, when we call it. Um, that's how the, the method, the function, the method gets information. Um, it can send back information with a return statement. So return, um, return is number times two. So return sends information back to the caller. There we go. Glad I looked at that. Okay. So fairly simple. Again, this parameter here is how we receive information in this function. This return statement is how we give information. Okay. So if we go all the way down to the bottom here, and we will run double this. Double this by itself doesn't print anything, right? So if we want to print something, we need to use the value that comes back. So in method and store the return value. Over here. So say um, result equals double this, um, and double. So we will print result. So we called double this. We sent it eight as the value. It sent us back hopefully sixteen. And uh, we stored that in the result variable, and then we're printing result. I'll put this in my uh, here too, because context is good. Result uh, is there. Uh, my uh, translation on again. I know, I caught this time. Hey, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry, I used this up plus 16 dollars 16. Not mathematically correct, but the code works good as well. I'm going to be cheeky. I'm just putting something out of my career. <laughs> Amazing. This is the part I wanted to show you. It's um, right here, this line. If you can follow the logic of that line, you get about three different things there. Like, um, we call the method with an argument. That method then ran and gave us back something. And then we use that something, which this evaluates to, and we store it in a variable. Then we enter it down here. Okay? So that's what we're talking about. That was the last topic I needed to cover there. Almost forgot. So I don't think the, the question that would use something like this is ever going to get more complicated than just like the value of this return. There might be a sure level question of like using that return value down in your logic below and saying like, okay, if I, if I have x equals results times four or something like that, what's the value of x? Then you'd need to see what does the method return. There you go. Question. Not, not, not I'm not, 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 not
Tracking some slightly more complicated logic here, as I was looking at doing this example. Um, so what we'll do is we'll change the value of x, we'll change the value of y, and then the question is what will x be when this is open? That's a pretty typical question. Um, so if I say uh, x uh, equals x plus 4, and then i equals i times 2. Time. And the question here would be what is the value of x after this runs? Yeah. So uh, as, a, as a student, if you can track through that, I would consider this to be a hard, difficult question. You need to be able to say what's going on with the loop, how many times does this run? Obviously, you could just type it into the compiler, but it's going to maybe cost you some time and maybe make you not as much of an expert at it. I would practice a question like this before you actually lead up to the, the day of the test. Event. Okay. 
So um, just talking through his logic a little bit here, and then we'll confirm with him that we're okay. Um, I starts with a value of three. Um, so the first time I check the condition here, I times two is six. So that's less than 20. So it does run the first time. Okay. Um, so X equals X plus four. So now X has a value of 10. Then I equals I times two. So now I has a value of six. It's really helpful when you're doing these to sort of write down and track where the values are. So uh, current X value would be, and I'll just change it as I go. Um, current value would be. So um, it started at six. So six, now if you ask this line the first time it becomes 10, and then I becomes six. Um, so now that is at 10, so we check the condition again. I times two is less than 20. I has a value of six, I times two is 12, that's less than 20, so it runs again. Okay. This gives you the idea of kind of how this model works as we talk through it. Um, so x equals x plus four, so this now becomes 13. Um, I equals i times two, so it becomes Then we check the condition again. It's going to go forever until it's false. Uh, y i times two is less than 20. I is value of 12. I times two is 24, which means this is false, which means we're done. So the question at the end should be 14. The answer should be 14. And let's confirm to show that I'm not a crazy person. Oh, thank goodness. I still get to give the test. 14. Okay. So that sort of shows the logic of how you want to update what your value is as you go. Take it step by step. It's pure logical thinking, tracking one step to the next. It's math. It's <laughs> good math. Okay. What else? What else do we want to see? Yes. Um, so I know on the proposed client for the website, like you can start wanting to connect questions. Are there any other things that you can look at that there besides working on that website right there? First, any examples you could find from not not official ones that we've written, but, but just samples that you could find from W3 schools. I think would be the best resource because they have the full lessons on that. So I'm in the process of writing this year's multiple choice questions. We're, we're revamping it because we're going from 20 to 40, and I just want to completely write about everything. Um, and so we may offer the previous tests, multiple choice questions, as examples now. Um, that's a not yet thing. The previous year before the test might not, can't promise. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that So the question posed was um, in encoding, there are many different ways of accomplishing the same thing, and that's very true. And the reason coding is so great um, with, with the syntax here. Um, and which ones should we learn essentially? Um, I think if you stick with what I've covered here today in terms of the, the simplicity here, expect to see the concatenation on the test as far as printing strings. Um, expect to, I will stick to that entirely. I won't use the comma notation. Okay. Um, as for the rest, you will. Um, I know there's specific examples you're thinking of as far as like different ways of, of this. Because the print one was the Yeah. Okay. Expect to see the concatenation way different schools of thought on that. I like that one because it's very clear as to this goes here, this goes here. I know there's an extra stir call for Python that doesn't run, which is slightly annoying, but we're not going to have very many like long expressions of printing. We'd be, we'd be concatenating a few values, maybe, to print something. Um, so I wouldn't expect to see, you know, 10 different elements in a print statement. But concatenation is what I will use. Functions with, uh, like, the default values or typed arguments, anything like that? Yeah. Um, the question was, will there be functions with typed values or default arguments? Oh, default values or typed arguments, like I said. Um, Python's a, a weekly typed language, so any Function header that you'll see will be in this form with just generic variables. Okay. 
we're not doing anything strongly typed in the test here. Um, now, one thing you might see in one of those questions, as we referred to over here, where like this code will give an output or this code will generate an error, you might see a, a mistype in terms of, for instance, attempting to divide a string by two. <laughs> Um, in which case, they would have to recognize, well, that can't be done. And if we go to the compiler, we'll see that. I'm going to try and test all of these questions thoroughly before it goes to print. I think last year I realized I had one error in one of the practice tests. The, the actual event test was all good, but um, one error. And uh, it's funny because I wouldn't have spotted it, but a kid pointed it out to me. So I was like, well. <laughs> Uh, no, no, that, that was um, just a dumb thing from the side. I'm talking about the actual practice test. We, the question we used at the event, there was, there was one slight mistake on there. It was like a, um, something needed quotations and didn't have it. And, and uh, yeah, it was an oversight on my part. So it was a thorough testing, but the actual test itself was all good. So no advantage was gained there. I think he was the only kid who noticed. So it's quite funny. I'm like, oh, yeah, we can put that in there. It's tricky. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> What else? We still got 10 minutes if we want to cover another example of any kind. Like I said, that model example I did there at the end, if your kid can follow something like that, that's pretty good logical thinking. Um, and I'd say they're pretty prepared for the day. Just need to study the syntax, take a look at it, make sure you're all good. Anything else we would like to see covered or questions about the event, the test itself? Yes. Um, nothing about the scope of variables? Um, no. So, so the question was posed, nothing specifically about the scope of variables. The answer is no, we will only use variables. We don't have a question like this one run because of the scope. Inside those, um, so to explain a bit, the scope of a variable is the life of it, essentially. If you declare a variable inside of a function, then it only exists until the end of that function. It doesn't exist, you know, outside that function. Um, what do you call it? Um, we will not throw anything confusing at students about that. Um, the values will be returned potentially. They'll use the return value, but there won't be anything about like I'm using a when I declared it in my function. That's not inside the the rules of the test, so I won't try and throw them off with that. Good question. What else can we think of? You can fill 10 minutes if we want to. Was there a particular topic that anybody found especially confusing here, other than the whole thing, that um, we'd like to see another example of? I think it's generally weird asking, but um, one thing I was listening to about in your for loop, mm -hmm. you could um, iterate over a list more directly. Talking about for each loop functionally? Or? Well, you, I think you could just do for i in my array. Yeah. And then the value i will, will won't be a, a pointer, it won't be an index, it'll be the actual value of right? So so you can um, you can teach students that it's right, and they can use that when they're when they're starting a question, but in terms of any um, Questions on the actual test. I think we're going to index this way. No, no, that's fair. I, I probably should double check the practice question that I had for traverses and range. I didn't use a combination of forms and indexing in the example questions on the site. So let's do that. Um, so let's see. Can I just do it more directly? There's a loop more directly. Because you're right, this is fair game, and that syntax might show up on a test. I mean, I think that because that is a little more intuitive than what I have here, I expect if your student understands loops and lists, they'll probably go, oh, this is all of these. And if they put it in the compiler, they'll get there too, right? Because they do it right. Um, but if it's a question, it could be either one of these. So, third in, uh, more directly. Um, so, sorry, I'll ask another loop. Right. This is the last part, so I'm up here. Um, so we'll say um, animals equals pig. Um, I got a 
tell you, my high school students get a check out of when I'm, when I'm filling out an array of strings, just calling out values. They love that more than anything. It's interesting. I get some weird values too. Um, little birdie. Uh, there we go. So, um, and you said if I go for uh, a, an animal. Habits, right? Uh, in animals. Um, and they say print. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Now, what? It's up here. Let me tell you why. This is a more direct traversal. Don't need the whole uh, indexing thing to go with the thing about the traversal. That's totally valid. Good call. Good catch. Thank you. The thing that could possibly be confusing is that might have to be defined by you might expect A to be, you know, one, two, three, four, five, right? But it's not actually the actual value. Yeah, because in a normal, in a normal pattern, like here, we're talking about a number here, we're talking this is functionally a full each loop. Yeah. If if you it, it does refer to the index, but there's a different way to print the index number. Oh, you mean know, first the index elsewhere? It refers to the index, but it returns the string in the index, not the index. Oh, oh, of course. <laughs> Thanks for that, Steve. You don't even know that. You don't even know that, but. I don't like that at all. The index, but it says, okay, but since you wrote it that way, I think this is what you want. <laughs> yeah, I hate Python. <laughs> English too. <laughs> well, I mean, the way to think about the person that you wrote is you just created a list in your for loop right here. And so you're, you're actually doing the exact same thing. You're reversing a list, correct? Right? It's just here. No, I, I just, uh, um, that, that's all. I just don't like that this refers to the indexes rather than the elements like a normal for each loop or two. Um, yeah, I mean, that's just uncomfortable for me as a C sharp developer. But no, yeah, that's great. Um, so, yeah, you, you may see this on a, in a question. It's not as if this covers a huge amount of the 40 questions that we have. We're talking maybe one or two questions, but this is fair game. This is a good understanding of it. So, thank you for bringing that up. Sure. Um, so, for example, if you had a writing error, if you wanted to just use the index, you could just use the index. Is there a way you can do that? Yeah, how do you do that? Uh, the question was, how do you actually print the indexes from this? No. Oh, no, I hate that. <laughs> so, this prints. Uh, And you got to do it outside this because you already have an array, but it wouldn't be in the board if you do it outside. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's not able to correct. Want. No, it'll just do the same thing. But if you want to just print, it would be uh, I I had say. that's my animal. It's just uh, print animals bracket A. Okay. That's backwards. If you're not getting the animals, uh, and then the bracket one, if we just are trying to print one, oh yeah, you right. could just print bracket one. It wouldn't be A, you're right, it would be one. Animal, bracket, 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 Six times, yeah. What's going to happen is going to print six times. Six times, because this loop goes six times. It goes to each spot in the array. So I expected the, the the question, as I understood it, was how do we print zero, one, two, three, four, five of this loop? Okay. The index values. I thought you were asking how to print six. Is that the question? You print just big. Yeah. If we were to do that inside the loop, it would just be animals. Everyone is there. It'd be this yeah. inside of the loop. Yeah. Pretty sure you're going to get. Yeah, you six times because the loop goes six times. As I was understanding, I think this miscommunication here was that we, you said that the A is actually the indexes zero, one, two, three, four, five. How do we print that? Yeah, it would be called. Uh, 
That's, and when you said animals at, at, like, at, at any or whatever, I'm like, no, 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 that can't be right. <laughs> That's okay. Up here, I have it. I would just put it high, right? That's why I like this way. Yeah. So then that says you should just include like animal dot index open parentheses and then a. Animals dot index a. But then if there are doubles, it won't like that, right? It, it, but that's like very interesting. It's like now looking at that object. So, 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 so it goes back to the way I said this, which this was essentially a for each loop, which means it's sort of an automated loop that goes to each position. It doesn't traverse it for us without us doing any indexing at all. So there is no direct way to access the index values, right? That's how it is in C sharp anyway. Um, for each loops are great because they're quick. Like this is this is functionally a for each loop. Um, didn't say for each, but that's what we're doing here. Um, they're quick and they're easy, but they're simple compared to the other here. But one of the disadvantages of them is you cannot actually see the index values. The other one is you can't change the values. Is that true here? You can change them, but that goes on like a weird tangent. It, it creates a new list that the frame space because that's weird. Is there something I, I have no software like this is like any comma and then you can you could have multiple variables in your parsing part and then you have one of them drag along the index for you. Okay. We're leaving the common man behind here. We're talking programming language. <laughs> Let's just finish there. I think uh, we're at just about 12 o'clock, so that's a good good closing point. Some of that stuff was was high level programmer trivia, but uh, the experience folks in the room are schooling me, which I do appreciate, especially because a lot of my experience is in C sharp. But um, I, I hope that this has been a helpful session for you. Um, if you have questions beyond this, we'll make sure that this video is available. We will make sure that this code is available. You can save this to a flash drive and get this put up on the site along with a link to the video. So you can mess with this. Um, I encourage you to have your students get into onlinepython.com and use W3 Schools or something as a resource and just start getting in there because the best way to learn coding is to type some code and learn it. It's a manipulative, right? The more you manipulate it, the more you're going to know. Question. Learning pseudocode? Uh, resources about learning pseudocode. I think it's just a matter of, so, so the format of your pseudocode doesn't really matter. The way that I consider pseudocode is say what you want to have it do, right? If you just have that in mind, then the actual format of the pseudocode you write is fine. It's a good question. So, okay, again, the most important thing, I'll come back and I'll close on that. The most important thing, and what I did here the whole time, is to say what you're going to do in a comment before you do it. And that's true for any language. Um, if you don't organize your thing before you do it, you're going to have a bad time. <laughs> okay. Thank you all for coming. Um,